you in a long time, but now I can see you on the screen. <laughs> Good to That's see great. that you're well. Um, for those who are not that familiar, uh, I've got some of my colleagues with me. Sophia is in Nairobi. Level Hung is in Joburg. Emmanuel's in Polokwane, and Ruby's in Johannesburg. So we're a bit from all over the world. Um, and we're very excited to be able to get a bit of a preview and a discussion of Alfredo's long-awaited book. Alfredo, I was visiting Zurich in 2016, 17, and 16, and you, you were sort of starting to, to put together the narrative. So this is, a, this is a massive project. Maybe even before we start on the poem, this is, this is a huge project. Tell us a little bit about the timelines and, and maybe well, how your well, ideas about the book changed. Yeah, well, what happens is um, uh, to, to write a book, um, uh, it's a, a monumental task, whichever way you'd see it. And most writers, we forget, but all most good books have taken a long time to write, you know. Um, uh, uh, any great writer uh, uh, takes at least 10 years to write a book, if it, if it has any depth. And this one is a personal story. It's a story of Hubert and myself over 20 years. So it's almost like a travel log, but it, it, it describes every one of the projects that we've been engaged with, or it's a selected number of projects, but it goes on for 600 pages. So, I mean, when, just to give you an idea, when we did the contract with Hanji Kant, we told them it was gonna be a 250 page book. Then it went up to 400. And now it's up to uh, 600 because as time went by, you have more things to say and you have more projects to show. And, and so that was really, um, it's been a, a rocky road to get that book out. Yep. Great. I think um, we can now, Alfredo, it's very cool. We've commissioned a poet called Emma, who for every week of the festival has produced a spoken word piece. I'll share them all with you on the website Beautiful. or later. But um, Ruby, if you could just start with that poem and, and get going. Thank you. Sure, let me just get the poem. And just stop me if, if you can't hear properly. Coding for Goku began when she sculpted grand dreams onto pottery, crocheted algorithmic patterns onto garments that we grew into. This was the original digital technology, a reflection of our artistic expression. In a world as big as one's imagination, made smaller by tech, we're brought together by clouds and streams, for even networks know the strength of connectivity, as we do the power of human connection. Africans, our imagination ruled the world, by it worlds advanced. New methods demand new forms, so we morphed. From mud huts to skyscrapers, from most code to binary code, where coding for girls is not sacrilegious, but said with the same simplicity as a makeup tutorial. Yes, a tomorrow where girls are lining coding like lining makeup, hacking bro codes, breaking barriers. Background has never birthed intelligence and talent, nor be they the DNA of privilege. If you can dream it, you can code it. Debug and refactor with every binary, not restricted by a mouse, keyboard, or data. Be it in a leafy suburb, downtown CBD, or the township. Creativity, your currency, your mind, a mine. With evolution, the true never changes. We just dance to it differently. Memory is stored in feeling. This flow is innate. There is no mathematics to the sound. But we have always known this. Rhythm is more in action than in thought. And it's playing out than it's scripting. Some have called it mysticism. I call it the resurrection of our ancestors who art in heaven through our images of unborn things, our words, sensations, song and dance, an embrace of Urban Festival 2020, an embodiment of the ideal. Alfredo, I'm going to connect you to the poet actually by email. You, you're both artists and poets and architects and I don't think she's an architect, but I think you'll have so much in common. She's 
you know, in a matter of a few weeks, produce these pieces about tech and civic empowerment. And I can imagine if you two somehow connect, <laughs> you'll produce these like masterpieces. Um, before we get going on your presentation, I would I just... love to. Do that. And by the way, I just spoke with Denise Scott Brown today, another yeah. South African. She called me on the phone and she said, someone's got to take care of her legacy. And then she started to describe a few people she thought uh, will hold that legacy. And among them, she said, and there's one poet that's very close to her. And we yeah. should connect that poet with your friend who just uh, did a beautiful poem on connectivity and dreaming. Yeah, when we were conceptualizing the Urban Festival, you know, playing music is very difficult because it, you know, on Zoom, it's not that clear. Um, and each week has this, this almost a special piece which she's produced. And I think it's at the opening ceremony, we, we even had her perform it live. So that was really amazing to see her face and to see her perform. Oh, well, please writer. connect. Maybe we can write something. Yeah, I, I'm sure. I'm sure she will. She's she's also very quick at writing. But Alfredo, before I got into your presentation and the formalities, um, this is not a book about architecture. You know, when the, in the way we've engaged as friends and as colleagues, you know, sometimes you were sketching, sometimes we were you're producing theatre, sometimes we were painting the pilot for Empower Shack. Sometimes we were in Zurich talking about housing. Maybe just talk about that. The book is not, the book is, you're formally an architect, but the book isn't about architecture. So maybe give us a bit of an idea of, of how we get to experience the book as, and, and not just being a traditional book, an architect, because the book is called <laughs> The Architect in the City. Um, I mean, it's, it's so normal for you to produce various in various mediums and but yeah, you're not really books. meant to produce theater, I suppose, and architects and buildings and architecture. So there's, um, it's, a, it's a narrative, right? So we really wanted for the first time to produce a book that people could read. So you need a good story. It's got to follow a storyline, right? So the story here is kind of interwoven between some of Hubert's experiences and mine together. Um, and so you've got real quotes every so often, chapter from chapter, that is the impressions and the actual direct voice of each of us. But then you also have this background narrative that begins in New York City. So it goes through how New York was the breeding ground for our social consciousness, how Harlem, working in Harlem, it introduces you to some of the uh, first professors we had, Richard Plunz, um, uh, Deanna Agrest, and, and uh, I mean, Andrew McNair, who later helped us start the think tank. And through him, uh, of course, Rem Koolhaas was instrumental in those early days. And then, because he had just been working on the book on Lagos, which never came out, right? And that was super instrumental for us to think about a city like Caracas um, compared to Lagos. So there we, oh, we have the South-South connection. Um, and then the, it slowly begins to tell you some of the trials and tribulations that we had to confront to produce the works that we later did. So each every two, three years, we had a new idea and it took us two, three more years to implement. So there's a lag between or in the narrative of, of about five years in between projects. Um, and so, and some projects uh, run very closely, two or three at the same year, and others are more uh, sparsed out. And we tell you what we were doing during those times, and we tell you the people we were meeting, and we were telling the issues we were confronting. So the book takes you really on a journey. And at the end, it says where we are now and where our mindset is. Now, as we are writing the book, of course, you know that I've been very active. In, in South Africa for the last at least 10 years or seven to 10 years. And so that had a huge impression on me. I mean, to go from Venezuela, then to work in Brazil, then to work in Colombia, and then to work in, of course, New York City, and then around Europe is one thing. But to work in South Africa, that was probably the hardest thing I could ever do. I think it was, it's hard for a number of reasons. 
Um, but yeah, over, back over to you. I know you wanted to share some, some thinking and some works. Um, I wanted to keep today quite, quite open. I think people sure. will get everything they need to from the book. Um, well, and over we'll those past 20, yeah, maybe a little intro. Over those past 20 years, you know, I've been thinking about, of course, migration, the other. I am product of migration, right? I left Venezuela, my hometown. Uh, we'll get to that in the end, but it's now destroyed Caracas, my city, my hometown city where our first works are. And usually an architect is very identified with his hometown, with his city. Um, in this case, I had to like stray away from it, but I never stopped thinking about it. So a lot of the things that we've written, Tori David, etc., have all been about that hometown. But when I got to Africa, I started to think how many parallels there were between South America and Africa, right? And I started to think about African mobility, you know, and, and more importantly, the idea of the global policy, making it that at any time, it's impossible to, to move. Now, even with Corona and, uh, and, and it's intensified. So I wanted to begin maybe tonight, if you guys allow me to, with a short presentation. Oh, I have to share screen, right? You, you, are, that... you are allowed. <laughs> So, okay, so let me try and do that, right? Okay, I'm sharing. Perfect, yeah. So here we go. I'm sure a lot of these things, yeah, people have heard before, but um, this yeah, is the book. We do have like quite a few questions from people already, so. Okay, I'll go fast on this little intro, so. No, just keep going, yeah. The architect in the city wants to talk about ideology, idealism and pragmatism, which is ultimately um, necessary to, to get things built, right? Um, here you see some inner pages. It's, it's quite, the format it jumps around the page. It has fold out pages, uh, wonderful photographs by Ivan Bahn. It has newspaper clippings. So it really is in a way that kind of a book that, yeah. um, expect to see from a traveler who's collecting uh, things, right? Um, but tonight I wanted to talk about this idea of, of uh, or tie into this idea of African mobilities, which is so, which is so well known uh, in the discourse, current discourse on, on, uh, on Africa, right? But I want to change that title and call it architecture and social immobility. Um, so South Africa, and here you see the architectural review from 1944, uh, was always depicted uh, in a stereotypical way, right? The way, you know, that representation of Africanness, right? Um, and how can we account for the dynamics that are going on today in South Africa, which I know well now through you and other friends at South African society, um, and maybe think about the, yeah, the, the, the directions these discussions are taking, right? So you have this project called South African Mo Mobilities by Empo Matsipa, and you know it very well. And now you have the cover of a magazine African mobilities, which is quite different than that architectural record cover of 44. And then you have this image of Lagos, futuristic image of a of kind of a futuristic Africa, right? Um, and so, which is a combination of Makoko and kind of dystopia. That's a very uh, curated, let's say, discourse about Africa. And the issues of this social mobilities or immobilities in South Africa is very much on the public debate, right? And it's become passionate and maybe dichotomized, either portraying an Africa rising, which I believe that mobilities, African mobilities is trying, or attending to the levels of inequality epitomized by the poverty of shanty towns, right? Or informal settlements. Yeah. So you've got this 
you've got this dichotomy going on. I represent one thing, let's say, Empo it represents another. But the reality is fires burning just a few weeks ago in Hout Bay in a crash and in a squatter settlement in, in Hout Bay, um, where I'm working at the moment. So this, this is quite a different reality. That's why I say there's actually immobility, not mobility. Um, we have argued in the past that, um, that, the, that this conversation must be multifaceted, of course, and must involve close attention to the position that you take and the notion of social space. So if there's one thing I want everyone to take today is discourse and projects of architecture and architecture itself must create social space for things to come together. Because we know from the apartheid and post-apartheid that there's still a fragmentation and that social space is actually uh, still quite parceled and fragmented. And you see it here still in some photographs, you know, down the highway to Kailiche from the airport. The social world can be represented as space with several dimensions. Of course, I'm sure Empo would argue also the several dimensions of what we call space, but it's constructed on the basis of principles of differentiation distribu and distribution constituted by the properties active within the universe universe in question. So that universe in question is how do we build an inclusive society, right? We've been told that there's scarcity of resources, but what are we really talking about with scarcity, right? We've been, we know inequalities and segregation, right? With Black Lives Now, and there's protests very well. But what are we really talking about when we talk about social injustice? And how do we act? Well, of course, the city are these bubbles of environment, politics, social, and economic, right? All coming together and overlapping. But we know there's enough food and water and land and energy on the planet to meet the requirements of the 9 billion that will peak on this world, right? But how do we address the immobility that people can, can't even own a home in Kailiche, where you have a million strong households, right? A million households um, and people just doing it themselves. So when we see images of scarcity or segregation in cities, we're not witnessing an unavoidable urban crisis, but a failure of equitable resource allocation. So we should attack the things by their name in order to to, to create a social space, a space of inclusion. Here you see Kailisha, for instance, on the screen, right? Um, we need to create economies of scale, proximities of public goods and services. You know, from electricity to housing, to water, to toilets. It's that simple, man, it's pragmatic. So I appreciate some of the more avant-garde discussions in the discourse about African mobilities, but, but we need to act. And that's what's so hard in South Africa. How do you, or in Venezuela, how do you create a community center on the edge between the formal and the informal city? But without infrastructure, without urban density, we call into question these distributive issues of equity, access and social justice. And you see it here in Sao Paulo. So I'm taking you all over the world. I don't think the African question or a South African question is independent of, the, of what's happening in Bangkok, Hong Kong, Brazil, Venezuela right now. And I think those conversations need to be connected and not segregated away in some kind of exclusive matter because there's so much to learn by sharing information. So these constructed scarcities that I'm talking about affect every aspect of our lives. We're told that there is a housing crisis, but everywhere we look there are empty properties. Scarcity here is constructed through machinations of tenureship and ownership. 
as soon as we understand that scarcity, scarcity as a constructed condition and not an in inevitable one, then it makes possible to creatively intervene in the process and construct and that deconstructs a particular scarcity. Here you see Caracas, where you see a city divided as frozen politics. This is the expropriation of land by government building a highway, dividing a city into two. So architecture spatializes and materializes uneven development. And we need to undo that, right? Here you see more valleys in South America of, of informal dwellers. So as a profession, architects have been complicit in this process. And that's the thing I wanna communicate. And we, in our discourse, if we're going to talk about South African mobilities or African mobilities or, or global mobilities, we need to tackle this complex question of, of inequity that is made by us, the professionals, right? So what do we do? We give power back to the people. And we go on the ground. We work with people on the ground as we did in Venezuela or South Africa. We, you work as a kind of you know, a, a moderator in the design process with no signature necessary, but you just bring ideas of what you interpret, what is necessary from hearing the voices of the people on the ground. You, where, you try to figure out where to act you identify with whom to act and you understand why you need to act or why uh, uh, something is needed to be built, right? And you can see in this map that across the globe, everything that's in red is the future 2 billion people that are gonna be on this earth in the next 30 years. This is real data. And it's like a graph because you can see the continents growing. India, Southeast Asia grows the most. Right? So this conversation is not only exclusive to Africa, it's, a, it's, it's actually across the world. And I want to maybe conclude with a little manifesto, is if anything I can do in my work and I can, trend and I can pass on, it's, the, it's to fight for the right to the city, to the right to infrastructure, to the right to housing, to, the dem to create democratic cities with your work safe cities, safe homes, and maybe stop building things, moving earth, asking fancy architects to build buildings, uh, making roads, the car city, and start thinking how you find a hybrid between the formal and the informal. Thank you. Thanks, Alfredo. I think there was a, there was a bit of a provocation in what you said earlier, because uh, there's sort of enormous an academic dialogue happening around the Africa rising, which I love, you love, we all love that dialogue. It's very interesting, it's, it's very cool, you know, it, it gets into published journals and things. But then there's, then there's and I, I pick on you directly because this is your book launch, <laughs> then there's you who, who tries things and does things. And I wonder if it's the doing things that doesn't upset people. It's, it's for example, I, I said this to you and I said this to other people, um, we know Empower Shack's not perfect. We know it. It's it's Empower Shack's entire philosophy is that it's an imperfect housing project, but it got built in a one phase, then two phases, then a, you know from pilots to. And there was so much lens in that. Forty-five families now. Yeah, and about one hundred and fifty people. About about a hundred people have had protection against COVID. Yeah. You created an algorithm out of that for reblocking. Ikailami were instrumental. You built relationships. Um, you 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 did things before the zoning was even in place. So I feel like there's a, the, the the tension is not just between hybrid, between formal and informal. It's between the doers and the talkers in a way. And I'm I'm a bit of both. So I you know I hold myself to account for that as well. Do you find that's a big issue in South Africa that we we don't seem to be able to to I mean, in 2015, you and you and Luyanda had the lecture with us and had like 150 people there. So we did the talk, but we also did the walk, which was painting, building, fighting, 
um, is that maybe the issue with our sort of culture here is that we can't merge the two. You're kind of either the talker in the sort of very Ivy Tower sense, but yourself, you lecture and you work on the ground. Is that is that maybe in a challenge here? Right. So, so um, of course, creating discourse is super important, right? The point is not to just leave it at discourse. You've got to also build, as you say, on the ground. You've got to, you got to have practice and theory. And this goes back to Alberti, to the Renaissance. This goes back to Brunelleschi, goes back to Michelangelo, goes to, back to Da Vinci, all the Renaissance architects, or, you know, Serlio, back to, you know, all of them. They wrote theory about architecture and they built. That is a tradition that carries on through 18th century France, Violet Le Doux, and it continues through Le Corbusier, the, you know, the principal modern architect who did theory, and he built, right? And he tried out his theories. And many of those houses, as we all know, by Le Corbusier, were leaking. He tried, you know, his five points of architecture, they were imperfect. His housing, but the Marseille block was the most expensive social housing block ever pure concrete, but it was an experiment. And that's all we can do. And that's why damned if you do and damned if you don't, you won't get praised. If we're in this business to be praised, to, to, to you know, did you read Jack Herzog's letter to David yeah. Chipperfield in, in Domus, where he says the architect can do nothing? That's okay. bullshit because he wants to walk around in soft shoes, nice Nike shoes and live in Switzerland and Basel have huge office and a couple of apartments, you know, and whatever. If you want to make a corporate business out of it and walk around, you know, in a cushy way, then of course you can't challenge. You can't be really experimental. Kenneth Frampton says that the, that the Hamburg opera is the biggest failure in his point of view. Because if you want to build a good opera, why would you build it for three times what it should cost on top of a warehouse with an escalators, miles of escalators leading you up to the top, put a, a, you know, a hotel inside. And then if your objective as a city of Hamburg was to create the best opera house, right? You know, Sharoon already did it in Berlin and he put it on the ground in flat, in a flat part of Berlin, and he made the greatest opera house. Why don't you, you know, concert hall, sorry. So, you know, this idea, this, this idea to be, to be iconic, this idea that came up from the 90s to build icons is all fine. And it's like, you know, there is room for, for that, but that's fashion, you know? It's, it's, it, it's as fashionable as, as anything else that is that is a com of, uh, um, commoditized artistic performance, right? That's not what we're talking about. I'm coming from a country where that has the largest migration today. UN in the latest report, 2019, five million people have left the country to all over South America, North America, Europe, et cetera. And so, and that, the, what's the reason? The reason is not enough was done to, for social equity. South Africa, I don't even need to get into it, but you know where you are right now. The RAND devaluing, you know, uh, the country in a political battle, um, you know, radicalizing, of course. That's not to say there's a wonderful artistic production. There is, right? Alfred, I've got some questions here. Um, I want to go to Sophia, my, my colleague in Nairobi. Sophia, go ahead and, and ask, ask your question. Just maybe pop your video on as well. Yeah, I'd like to see people's faces, yeah. Um, hello. Hi, Sophia. Hello. Um... Thank you very much for your presentation. Um, I really resonate with the dichotomy of like Africa rising and the grand inequalities that exist um, in African cities. So um, I know your work has mostly been involved in informal cities. So I just want to ask, what do you think that um, urban practitioners and governments and city leaders can learn from um, how informal cities come up and how they function? because there's always input being given from 
academia and government into informal cities, but very rarely people want to learn from the informal context. Yeah, thank you. Well, there's incredible amount. Um, let me answer your question in, uh, in, uh, in, a, in a different way. Let me share a screen for a second. You, I think you'll enjoy this, um, if you allow me, because that's where we were. Um, let me see how to do that. That's kind of cool that we can go back and forth from presentations. So, Sophia, thank you for your question. The construction process is what we can learn. We call these two, Oscar Genaro and his brother, pirate developers, right? But John Turner, who was in academia, started to document this idea of the freedom to build, people building their own city. And he started to document how cities in Peru were built. And he said, there's incredible intelligence. What happens? And here also, Betty Spence, maybe a South African, uh, uh, Hannah Leroux from Witz, um, turned me on in 52. She also started to see how she could construct a house that could grow over time. And here, let me take you on that journey. Here we are in Peru. These are the valleys that are informally settled. They're all desert valleys. The first thing they do is they name and constitute a company, like a collective. And then they start to put down stakes, wood stakes in the sand. And over time, little shacks appear, but they lay down a grid. And then that grid solely gets a road over time. So it's building over time. And then, of course, a little shack industry begins, just like in South Africa, which is so funny, right? And then people who have built in very precarious materials over time start upgrading with some mud bricks. Or in South Africa, it could have been blocks. But it, and then slowly, those houses become to be transformed. And they become hybrids between formal and informal. So you have, you know, archaic mud buildings and at the same time, tin roofs and metal, and then the roads start to appear. And over time, they become cities. So here you can see that process in a little animation we did. So we try to do everything. We try to produce data. We try to tell you how a house grows over 25 years. We, we try and visualize it. And then we try to bring examples. And that's the best we can do as practitioners. And then hopefully we can learn how to, how to best program a city in the way we used to be done since medieval times. In other words, built over time, not built with a key in hand. You have to pay a realtor and you get a little apartment in a, in a housing development. So yeah, I mean, I think we can learn a lot. Stop share, sorry. There, I think we can learn a lot from from these yeah. examples and i'm not the only one who's done it teddy cruz and there's aravena and there's many others i think we have another question from um emmanuel who's in polokwane yeah emmanuel go for it you're you're on okay hello everybody uh first of all i want to say i'm really enjoying this conversation i'm finding it really insightful um so yeah just my question uh just reading from the website for Urban Think Tank. I see it is an interdisciplinary design organization. So Alfredo, I'd just like to ask, like from your experience and past projects, how do you manage implementing the different design philosophies coming from the different professionals in your organization? Alfredo, I think Emmanuel's asking because he's he's like from a geomatics, right? Quantity yes. surveying, like moving mm -hmm. into urbanism. And so it's very nice to say you bring the disciplines together, but I think we both know in reality, yes. <laughs> like, you know, <laughs> he wants to go on site and help with housing and, and planning, but, you know, he's, he's stuck doing his job. So maybe share a bit more about in different countries, how you bring them together formally. Or well, interesting, Emmanuel, I've been to Polokwan, so I know oh. it. And I went through the informal settlements there. I have wonderful photographs how they're growing there on the outskirts, right? And this downtown Polokwane is quite interesting. You know, the mm. heart of downtown, right? Yeah. And I found it like a, almost like a, like some kind of cowboy city in a way, you know? <laughs> you know, at the crossroads in, you know, in the desert, almost like the Western, right? Mm. Um, 
So uh, I know where you're from and, and it's quite cool. So um, interdisciplinary work can only be done, not in theory, but actually what brings together all the different practitioners from all the different fields is project-based. So you connect people to actually a real project together. If we sit here and try and discuss interdisciplinary thinking and overlap it in our different visual or our different writing skills and try to map those different ideas out in some website or some academic program or something, it doesn't work. The only place in which the fields overlap concretely is if we work together on a concrete project. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then we can, each of us can inform the other and our decisions then are intermixed. And I get influenced by what you think about, you know, geotechnical or whatever, you know, and then, and then you get influenced by what, what I think about building over time and, and how can we do, you know, things differently. So, and then we, we strike a conversation on that round table around a very concrete project, like how do we build 70 houses on this site? I see, thank you. Alfredo, before I go to the next question, I just wanted to ask, I know with, with City Lift, the, the foreshore proposal that we all worked on like crazy people a few years ago, um, how much of the politics did you include in the book? <laughs> uh, quite a bit. So. So, I mean, let's say a page, a couple of pages, right? Um, sure, those politics were super interesting to me. It was the most evident moment where I could translate what happened in Venezuela to South Africa, um, where, where the jury was dismissed, new jury created, critique at all levels. It was appeared from the day one to be a very legitimate competition for the foreshore, you know, what to do with the highways, unfinished highways. And it ended up practically, and you can tell me better, costing the mayor her job. Yeah, amongst other things as well, yeah. Although she did get a promotion to a national minister, so <laughs> she's, she's very smart and capable. Um, yeah. Well, there's not too many people who want to do the work, right? Oh, uh, apparently. Uh, we have a question from Lebo Khang in Johannesburg. Um, Lebo, over to you. Sure. Um, good evening, operator and everyone. Um, my question um, centers more around um, completion. Um, so what is your relationship with complete, completion and the completedness of buildings and projects? Um, when do you feel, if ever, um, that a project is finished? That's interesting. Yeah, I could be very pragmatic and say when the money runs out, you know, but and and that's probably the reality because I just can't help but but keep adding on new elements to projects, right? Just like a painter. But what and I believe that projects are always incomplete. And if even if we look at uh, you know the most refined piece of architecture, um, let's say Rockefeller Center. I'm sure, you know, maybe you know the story about the murals that they got Mexican muralist painters for Rockefeller on the on 1930. They were inaugurating the Rockefeller Center, beautiful building by Raymond Hood, center of downtown Manhattan, and uh, and and but they wanted to do some murals on the inside of the buildings. And they got Orozco, the famous, and Diego Rivera to paint a worker's mural. But he put Lenin's face, and he put a, like a, a like a, a Russian, you know, a hammer and a sickle inside the the mural. And the night before, Rockefeller had them take it down, and we lost one of the most incredible murals of collaborative WPA work artists work um, association of the 1930s. And so I think Rockefeller Center would have been more complete had they continued putting the um, uh, putting art uh, the way it was it should have it should have had art within the building so that it would be a nice mixture between art and architecture coming together in a in in a in a fused way. But so that's a maybe one example but I believe that all of our projects are incomplete. 
The cable car that I did in Caracas wasn't fully finished with our vision. Um, the, the gyms, we wanted to build 100 gyms for sports fields all over South in Venezuela. We weren't able to, we built only five. But it doesn't matter because there will be new generations who will take on the fight and who will be inspired by the incomplete works and try to complete it in some other way. Thank you very much. I think that was Alfreda, I'm, I'm wondering, in, in, I know we spoke a bit about um, your work in writing and your work in terms of uh, theatre. How, how, does, how does the book, I mean, I know it's quite a long book now, but how did you, how did you incorporate that into, into this book? How does one share that? Yeah, it, I mean, a holy contract is in the book, but since the book was about architecture and we do touch often how we have ventured outside of our comfort zone into other disciplines. Um, so beginning from that I was hanging out uh, in Warhol's factory in early, you know, 80s, and end of the 80s to, to the fact, and I was very inspired by the factory and that comes out clearly in the book or the interdisciplinary of Warhol going from painting to video, to film, to music, to all those things, right? And creating a kind of zeitgeist moment. We very much saw that we see the urban think tank as a collective that really has interdisciplinary um, kind of uh, actors who are constantly influencing each other. We, um, so we do talk about how Poetry has influenced me, how, how theater writing influenced me, and how it helped me to engage the community in Kailich. Okay, I just wanted to give the attendees a chance to ask some questions as well. Uh, if anybody has a question, we can add you to the panelists. Um, you can also just raise your hand and use the Q&A and, and uh, the chat box. Um, so while we wait for some questions, Alfredo, how I think I was I saw some pilot in Durban about a, um, which was about building a second story, um, a second sto story um, home in an informal settlement, and I mean it would be sort of, it, I mean I don't want to just talk about COVID, but at the same time, <laughs> we're we're in the COVID world, and now we're sort of some days we're post COVID, and other days we're back in the COVID world. But it seems like a lot of the ideas around the city information and around sustainable densification is even more relevant these days. And then I also saw that our government had these horrible statements around de-densifying informal settlements um, simply because they hadn't thought, you know, they hadn't created mechanisms for second stories or third stories and and access for fire and emergency services and suddenly de-densifying, which we did in 1994 with the RDP housing program. We took everyone, put them on the cheapest land in single story dwelling. So no, nobody seems to learn. Um, what do you, what are some of the key lessons from this current war that, that make you almost want to put all your products on a big billboard? By, by the way, yeah. there's been a lot of discussion on density and COVID. So, on the one hand, there was the first notion that too much density spread COVID faster. Yeah. But then they started to discover and the numbers came in, that the, especially in, in New York City, right? That actually the suburbs was where COVID was spreading faster. And everyone said, what? The suburbs, those single family homes, right? And it, the, the truth is suburbs have less community facilities, let's say. And so you get in a car and you have to go to a shopping mall to buy your food. Or, you, or everyone goes to one location, one big mall to buy their goods. So it's in the malls where it was spreading. Instead, when you have you know, a city where you've distributed all of the you know, goods and services in all over the, the neighborhood, like in France and in Paris or Cartier, shops everywhere, every neighborhood has its, its, its distributed uh, goods, they go, be it clinics, libraries, 
uh, food shops, you know, everything, services. Then you find that the urban is not so bad, right? Because because um, you, everyone, no one, not everyone congregates to the same point. Okay, that on one hand. On the other hand, don't you find it crazy that that uh, it happened in R Stalinist Russia, for instance, or or even Khrushchev Russia post Stalinist. Um, they didn't understand how to build a city that would reflect the socialist ideals that they had. And so they resorted to the big blocks, modernist blocks, and they built these incredible long Moscow Allee, um, you know, the, these huge housing blocks that later proliferated all over the Iron Curtain. From Romania to to you know to Hungary to Czechoslovakia to everyone, right? So their vision of a city, of a socialist city, right, was these functionalist blocks devoured from the ground, uh, disconnected communities in the air. Funny, that doesn't sound like a social yeah. experiment, right? In the same way, South Africa, like Venezuela, we're we, we are uh, brother nations, if you want so, in philosophy. We are social democratic, left-leaning, uh, socially oriented, looking how to create our policies for the social, for the social democracy. Um, and, and, and yet, just like in Venezuela, we don't know how to build social experiments, right? Or how to, to reinvent the city that would go with the political ideology, right? So you look at Torre David, which is a project of ours in the middle of the Chavez revolution, where he goes power to the people. And he evicts uh, 3,000 families from the tower that they had built themselves right, informally and had done and had shops, uh, churches, sports fields inside. They had made a vertical city in the most interesting social community experiment. So here I go again. You, you hear the South African wanting to de-densify, right, to, to, to go in and open up holes in those informal centers or re-block them, right, in kind of camps. That would be the most modernistic, more you know, using the bulldozer as 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 the design tool, and that's anachronistic to the idea of creating any kind of um, uh, uh, of dream that Mandela might have had for a social democracy in South Africa. So I don't understand. Is yeah. it maybe we our language is not? It, our, the language architects speak is not communicating. Even among architects, we don't understand each other, least politicians. Maybe politicians don't understand the city. Maybe the, the city experts can't communicate well enough to the politicians. Maybe the kids need to be trained in school about architecture. Alfredo, I'm gonna to switch to my, my colleague in Cape Town, Cisco, who today was on site in Talfasok in Mitchell's Plain, where the public realm people sort of just feel forgotten about. Um, you know, Mitchell's Plain is sort of six to eight neighborhoods and everything from woodlands to Lentechia and uh, designed as a color township. I mean, we showed that video to you so many times around the apartheid propaganda forms. Um, Cisco, I thought maybe, I mean, today we planted one tree because there was not a single tree. There's a highway which divides Two, two little parks, we're putting down some seating. And uh, Siska, I was wondering if you had any reflections in terms of your site visit today and and um, something to ask Alfredo about, you know, we talk about, we have so many like discussions and dialogues about uh, Africa rising and then you go on site and you, you're like, there's nothing there. We're just trying to do very simple projects. I don't know if you have any reflections or questions just based on that. And, you know, maybe Alfredo needs to to, to work with us in, on a bigger vision. Go, go for it, Cisco. Hi, thank you so much for a very interesting dialogue so far. 
Um, I think this is a question that's bothered me since my studies, um, is we often tend to almost romanticize, especially in South Africa, romanticize the informal and kind of a grassroots bottom up development. And today, although it's a community project um, that we're trying to do, I also kind of thought that we might, there should be like an avoidance almost of romanticizing this and how do we avoid it? Or uh, is it not a danger to romanticize these types of developments? Of, of course, of course. Yeah, just for a bit of context, I don't know if I can share, I'll try and share my screen, but but it, it's very small. It's, it's, you know, a few seating walls and a tree because kids are playing there and there's like six traffic lanes of cars flying past. But I, yeah, I agree. It's, it's tricky for us to sort of, do we market the project because we're not doing something great and big, but, you know, how do we not romanticize at the same time? Well, did you ask anyone what to do there? I mean, if yeah, the community it's like two years, huh? like two years of us, we've done it over two years. So we got a tiny grant and we, we're now doing some things, but maybe it's yeah, that's what I say. Maybe it has to be a do it yourself. Maybe that's hard. Maybe it's hard to get people to lay some bricks, to do some wood, cut some wood, find some recycled material, you know, whatever, but that can be done. I'm sure you can, you can add some things to that park. I don't know what it is, whether it's a roof it needs or a library or something, but maybe there's some program missing who knows, but I'm sure with a great strength and leadership, you know, raising your voice, you could maybe find, um, you know, free labor and people would very much be active in building their own park, right? You do it, you see it in New York, community gardens have been so super important, little pocket gardens that are municipal gardens owned by the city. And those are handed over to a street or a community and they're going fast and the city wants to, to now control them and, and, and privatize them, those parks, the, the, the parks commission. But for many, many years, they were the life and breath of a, of a community action with vegetable gardens and things like that, right? Um, now, romantic, romantic is not bad. Right. Um, if if I romanticize the informal, I also romanticize the old town of Fez in Morocco that's been around for 5000 years. And it's the most incredible living city. You know, it's practically a, a living university. So but that's all built ground up by the people that there was no architect coming in there. It was all built by additions and 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 like that, I could tell you so many other places. So it's not romanticizing. I it, everything that you know and you understand in school, that is the way that architecture is being taught is product of the 20th century. We were building cities ad hoc self-built in the mountainscapes of Europe, everywhere around, villages were being self-built. In the Ticino, in the mountains, you know, where Zumtor is practicing architecture, you don't need an Arctic to build those houses out of wood and, and stone. And they're incredible things, right? Uh, and, or in Norway, where I am now, you know, in the countryside, those are all self-built cabins. Every Norwegian knows how to build his own house. And there's no rules for that. Yet, the 20th century modern Americanized city, Western centric city, since the you know, turn of the uh, 20th century has now imposed laws. And, and those laws are, are really artificial. And those laws were created to control the real estate market and to control taxes, you know, property taxes, and to create prosperity if you want, because America was built off real estate. So we have to understand that the rules in place and the way of building the cities that maybe we like. I promise you early Cape Town, the, the, the grids of downtown Cape Town, and some, I doubt there's too much left there of those early days, but that was laid down by people themselves. Yeah. When it was a you know, bootleggers, bootleggers town. Alfredo, there's a, there's a question about your favorite project in South Africa. Um, and then the, there's two parts. The other one is the most challenging part of, of your cable car project in Colombia, in Caracas. Yeah. Okay. Do, oh, you're, the question is that. Um, yeah, the question is favorite project in South Africa. 
and why and 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 also the second question the most challenging part of of the cable car project in Colombia got it, got it. let's start with the the Colombia the challenging cable car project okay so the cable car project was very ambitious. It was 2.5 kilometers, five stations. And we didn't want to just see it like a string of pearls of, of stations all connected by a wire and you could glide up and over the city, the informal city and then back down to the formal city. But we wanted each one of those stations to become hubs social you know hubs where we wanted to add housing community center sports and we did add some of that infrastructure but not enough and then we wanted the whole hillside of 78,000 people in in san agustin to become a a magic mountain we called it, you know, reminding us of Thomas Mann's novel, which would be, you know, everything growing, pocket gardens, children's sports, whatever, running around painted stairs, and, and it would become a kind of popular capitalism, if you want so, right? Everything would have value, what was invisible, the value on that hill, just like Italian hill towns, or just like Greek villages that have become so valuable to so many who will go to the Greek islands and buy all those, you know, uh, popular uh, farmhouses, basically. So we were hoping to create that. And we wanted to transfer the value back to the people because people don't move. And it's not gentrified in South America. You know, there's no gentrification. It's like almost saying that no, that we would now buy a home in Kailiche in the middle of of you know BT South. No, gentrification will not occur. Maybe on the edges only, and that maybe is not bad if it's run shops run by the community themselves. Now, my favorite project in South Africa. That's a maybe it's big a secret. question. Maybe it's, a, maybe, it's, maybe it's even a secret. <laughs> yeah, let me let me just let me think. Uh, the landscape, for one, of course, but that's not a project. But um, I, I would have to say my favorite project. Whose is it, and what is it? Maybe it goes back. Um, it's probably the old city, you know, uh, probably it's no longer there, but District 6 was my favorite project. I bought two photographs of District 6, you know, because I thought it was the perfect model for Empower Shack. It was, it was small row houses that all gathering around some public space. So that was definitely one of my favorites. Um, but I'm now at loss uh, to produce but definitely the downtown, the kind of edged downtown closest to, to, um, to, to District 6, that, that kind of more edgy part of the downtown, that's my favorite part of Cape Town. Yeah. Alfred, I don't think we have much time left, but I just wanted to, to uh, ask you, there's a question here that says, can you explain more about your concept of a pirate urbanist? Uh, <laughs> I don't know where they got that from. Well, the pirate urbanist, and let me, it, the pirate urbanist is basically just empowering the individual to take the, the rights in his own hand. So they tell you in Kailich and in informal summer, you cannot build a toilet, right? There are ways, and in Boya, there are all kinds of dry toilets from poor neighborhoods in Mexico City where you use chalk, calc, right? And, you know, that you put on dead bodies, which will disintegrate the, the, the smell and of, the, of, the, of the feces. No? Now, so I believe that with very little income, those who have some opportunity and are just coming out of architecture school and have been privileged to go to UCT should fundraise and everyone should go and up scale, uh, uplift and upscale and leapfrog one, one shack in Kailiche. Find a friend there and just help him build it up and out. And, and just that is pirate urbanism. Don't ask anyone, just do it. 
They did it themselves. No one's going to say anything to you. And that's how you can empower the community by showing them how to do it. If you're a young architect coming out of school, just go and do one community service and try and, and add on or improve one dwelling. And the, imagine if we have, you know, 3,000 graduates of all the schools doing that. That would be a pirate urbanist. We should all get hats and eye patches for that. <laughs> to become to become pirate urbanists. Um, Alfredo, I just have uh, one more question about we screened your film um, that you've been worked that you've worked on and, and exhibited around um, Robin Hood. Um, have you thought about new film projects? And I mean, how do you how do you sort of how does your book reflect on some of the films? Um, yeah, we decided that we're going to write another book on the filmmaking. So that this book doesn't include the filmmaking, it's about architecture. But, but let me tell you right now, we are sitting with a, our first feature film, an hour and a half on architecture, on urban think tech and on the city, global cities around. And it is being edited by a South African at the moment. And, uh, and Jacques de Villiers, uh, Michel's brother. And it will be good, post-production will be done in South Africa. So hopefully we'll get an, uh, a first screening in South Africa and we see the timeline in about a year. Well, we'll, we'll be, ha be happy to screen it at our future cities and all of our- Yeah, and it's called, working title is, This Is Not My House. Ah. Okay, I'm going to squeeze in one more question. I know you have a thousand things to do in this Zoom COVID world, uh, but it's from Indonesia. It says, um, it's from Zarul. Seven years ago, Zarul attended the Jakarta Vertical Camping Masterclass where you were giving a lecture. Yeah. And uh, they can remember vividly that architects, at the time that architects have the responsibility to help providing residences for informal society, um, architects should be the mediator between government and informal society. I do agree about this and your previous statement that we need to give the power back to the people. Uh, Zarul's question is when we as an architect already try to empower and work with the community to build their own living environment, as time goes by, the local government finally showing their interest to this community and started to claim the people's hard work as the government program. I think we all know about this. As an architect and part of the community, how should we react? How should we mediate? I think the questions around, you know, uh, I think even the tiniest project we worked on, like a pop-up park, the mayor was there to cut the ribbon. So how, is it about ego? How do you deal with, with the government stepping and saying, oh, it's suddenly it's our project? I mean, I think the city of Cape Town featured the Empower Shack, even, even though they were opposed to it for like two years, I think. Right, right. So I don't ego? mind. Ego? I don't mind who wants to claim it. Yeah, exactly. It's not about ego. It's just about getting it done, right? So I think we shouldn't worry about, it. and that's why our book actually says, I don't have an ideology that is affiliated to a political party. I have an ideology about, about the world, about the world that I want to live in, but I don't have an ideology that, that responds to any tendency, political tendency. Um, so therefore, I don't marry any political party, but all the political parties can claim the work if they contribute. I think on that note, we'll take any final thoughts or questions. Um, Emmanuel, Sophia, Lebo, Cisco, any final thoughts? Ruby, um, while we have Alfredo here. Um, Alfredo, well, I mean, congratulations on on the book. I think, I mean, it's <laughs> it's a book, but it's also like just a, a diary. I mean, it's a lot of the parts you sort of, I think you were like voice noting people and narrating parts of it and acting out parts of it because it's hard to tell a 20 year story by just typing. Um, you had lots of people involved in the book. You must feel really accomplished, but- um, well, That's fine because Everyone only likes the signature architect. 
And everyone knows, I mean, I'm so transparent. Everyone knows my methodology for making works, whether it be a book, it's all a project or a building. And my methodology is quite inclusive and it's quite, um, uh, uh, it's, it's quite uh, uh, the, a asking questions. So I ask a lot of people questions, a lot of people give answers, some answers I listen to, some I don't, and a lot of people get frustrated, and, and, but a lot of people get to contribute in, in many ways to the products that we make. And, 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 the, and this is truly why I believe we have functioned as a collective and, uh, and I am not uh, a signature, uh, let's say, um, authoritarian art right, of, of the design. And rather, the des my designs are hybrid. And if you sat with us and you did watch us, maybe Hubert and me working together or working with Scott or with Danny or with anyone else, you would see, or even with the people who worked on the play, um, it, you, you saw incredible uh, sketching over sketches of someone else's sketches and then my sketching again, again. It's kind of a tracing right? It's layers, layers of density until the thing gets solidified. And I urge everyone to work that way. It's right. so much richer. The product is so much, it's more, it's more sustainable because it gets identified with the community uh, actors and with more individuals. Alfredo, 30 seconds. Anything we should be looking out for in the next, I know where the book sort of looks in the past and a bit to the future. Any, any secrets about the next year? I yes, know to my South African audience, I have not left South Africa. I'll be there in February, again building. We're doing a next row of houses for Empower Shack. We're building a playground that'll be quite spectacular. And we will, and we're also in the process to get approval for, for a three, uh, theater um, project uh, uh, for music hall and, and uh, dance hall and theater hall in Kailich in front of the police station. Great. Thanks so much, Alfredo. Um, to all the attendees, if you go to urbanfestival.co, we've had 21 days of events across various platforms, exhibitions, webinars, panels, there are about 10 days left of Urban Festival. So there's really a lot to look forward to. Alfredo, I'll just mention some of them. You've got the Integrated Urban Development Framework Bootcamp, well, the workshop tomorrow, which is the fourth workshop. Um, the, the IUDF is South Africa's sort of grand urban framework around how we can bring society to build, to build better cities. Um, there's a session on, on Integrated Area-Based Violence Prevention Interventions tomorrow at 11. There's a Jam Cafe about new media tomorrow at 4.30. Creative Procurements Friday at 9. Uh, we have our Lunch and Learn of Our Future Cities Friday at lunchtime. City Data Visualization Friday afternoon. Um, there's just so much in the next 10 days. This is a really jam-packed week. So please keep sharing on social media. Um, Urban Festival is meant to be a festival. Um, and thanks everyone for joining us tonight. Go to the um, urbanfestival.co website to learn about the IUDF. Go to the iudf.co.za website. We've got Stephanie Chetty who's also joined us today from, from the National Ministry of Cooperative Governance. So really great for everyone to give us some of their evening and have their dinner while watching us. Um, you can buy the book um, on amazon.com and um, I think the book's, Alfredo, when is the book coming out officially? Is the book out? Yes, they're trying to get it out for Christmas. Hopefully, if not January, it'll be out. But I just want to say one thing with these webinars that you've been doing and, you know, in this long, this long fe urban festival, I just wanted to say, you don't need to live in a city anymore to be urban. Yeah. It's exactly. I mean, we've, uh, some of us have been living between various <laughs> locations and, and cities and farm towns and all sorts of places. And, uh, yeah. Yeah, and that's I mean, the wonderful people, thing of this new era. Some people are back with their parents, <laughs> unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I look forward to seeing you next year. I hope you can get a flight from Oslo, maybe via, via 
I don't know, Amsterdam or something. Amsterdam, I think so, yeah. Yeah, cool. I'll chat to you soon, my friend, and thanks so much okay, for your time. All the best. Thank you so much, everyone who joined. Thank you.